Hi everyone, welcome to episode 40 of the Startup Playbook podcast. My name is Rohit Pargava and each week I interview successful founders, investors and subject matter experts on how they got started, the strategies they used to succeed and their advice to current and future entrepreneurs. Before we get into this episode, a quick reminder about Startup Playbook TV, a new project where I bring in early stage startups and founders to provide them with exposure and help them navigate through some of the common issues they face such as finding co-founders, getting traction and fundraising. The first four episodes can be found on YouTube by searching for Startup Playbook TV, or you can go directly to the playlist using the link bit.do slash Startup Playbook TV, which I will also include in the show notes for you. If you want to be on a future episode, shoot me an email at rohit at startupplaybook.co. So coming back to episode 40, in this interview, I sit down with Stuart Richardson and Darcy Norton, the co-founders of York Butter Factory and partners of Adventure Capital. In the interview, we will be talking about the need to have a mindset about abundance, the collaboration opportunities between startups and corporates, managing the different stages of growth, and the structures that startups need. Without further ado, here is my interview with Stuart Richardson and Darcy Norton. Hi, Stuart and Darcy. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to be on Startup Playbook Podcast today. It's great to be here. Thank you very much for having us. Um, so for those people that may not be familiar with, uh, with both of you or, or with YBF, can you share a little bit of your background story and, and uh, where you are today? Sure. So I guess it's a fairly uh, easy story. I'm a country boy. I grew up in country Victoria in Stall. Had a little bit of a dream to be a pilot, but um, seemed to have gone a different path through a number of uh, startup style pivots. Um, Having gone off to join the Air Force uh, straight from uh, high school, I uh, completed an aerospace engineering degree there before my little boy dream sort of disappeared. Um, being too young and too dumb to know any better, the next step was to obviously start a consulting business, um, something that went quite uh, well, and uh, you know from there really sort of enjoyed learning how to grow a business at a very, very fast rate in a, I guess, rapidly changing environment, being that of military, defence and intelligence, um, and the understanding the machinery of government. So, you know, that was an amazing, uh, amazing ride, but, uh, you know, again, pivots come through. I took a sabbatical in 2009 and studied at Stanford, um, completing the Stanford Executive Program there, one of the youngest to ever do that. Um, before returning home with the vision that venture capital in Australia was very broken and there was a huge opportunity to, to build from the, from the ground up a new ecosystem and that's really brought about both the venture capital and, uh, and the York Butter Factory. So I've got a sort of parallels in the same in my story. I'm Perth boy, so a country boy as well in a way. Um, moved across to Melbourne about 10 years ago, um, studied finance and uh, got into the asset consulting game, did a few years in there and started to get bored quite quickly, um, having done my uh, usual millennial stint of about three years and uh, took a three month trip over to South America where I uh, happened to meet Stuart. So um, we traveled together for a little while and then upon coming back decided that um, we might try to work together. So I dovetailed in when he just got back from Stanford and. Um, you know, the idea of becoming a portfolio manager really excited me, so we pretty quickly got together and started considering how we would put together a early stage venture capital limited partnership uh, investment fund. What, what did that sort of early stage look like of, you know, um, clearly both of you sort of got along and, and shared the same vision for, for what it is that you wanted to create. Um, what did that look like from taking that, that sort of big vision or, or the concept of what you wanted this to be into, into turning it into something real? So the early days were interesting. We were, I mean, I, I worked for nine months at my old job, uh, moonlighting in the evenings. Um, eventually the risk department at work decided that it was appropriate that I either stayed uh, without doing any adventure capital stuff or left. Uh, I was glad to have that push, so I left. Um, we started doing a little bit of consulting work in the early days, working with uh, some of the notable startup organizations of the time. Uh, we were working with the Polonizer crew up in Sydney, uh, doing a bit with some of the startups down in Melbourne. Um, our um, uh, early days were in the Grollo offices above us in the uh, Rialto building and we sat in a little uh, box of uh, glass meeting room, probably about three metres by three metres that we had to clean up at the end of every day. Um, and, then, and that was about the time that we uh, helped found Equium with uh, the Grollo family. So Gabrielle McMillan was sitting there. It was a pretty small uh, and interesting existence. Um, 
Yeah, so you know, certainly, uh, you know, as much as we probably started from the uh, from the ivory tower, we knew that to grow an ecosystem from the grassroots, we needed to really come come down out of that tower because you know, taking meetings from entrepreneurs in marble foyers and uh, in front of uh, stuffed eight foot uh, Kodiak bears um, didn't have the right feeling to it. So you know, we really uh, you know, were fortunate when we uh, when we were walking around the you know, King and Collins Street area. Um, just uh, to stumble upon the, the York Butter Factory. Um, the York Butter Factory, uh, there was this building, 160 years old, heritage listed, but empty, and had been for, for two years. And uh, you know, it just had that character where it was clear that, you know, why couldn't this be, be something else? Why couldn't this be you know, something that you know, we could really give a home to the activities we were getting involved in, because at that time we were sort of starting to things like see things like Silicon Beach drinks um, start to, to really come up, and, and and you know I think in Sydney you know Silicon Beach drinks was certainly a, a real genesis point of uh, of the community there. Um, it then made its way to, uh, to to Melbourne. It started off was quite nascent, but uh, you know very quickly we got involved, and all of a sudden it was you know there was forty plus people coming along, so. You know, progressively Silicon Beach now, I think, is one of the largest groups here in Victoria. Um, but it's one of those things where it was, you know, really became a melting pot for people who had curiosity around their entrepreneurial, um, I guess, uh, visions or or just curiosity in general. What is this entrepreneurship thing? How can I create a company like Mark Zuckerberg or or uh, whoever the next sort of you know big thing was back seven eight years ago? Um, so you know, I guess that to, to give a home to the communities we found was essentially one of the first pieces of the puzzle because we knew that it wasn't sustainable to wear our shoe leather out running between the very few events even that were happening at that time but rather if we gave them a home and attracted and provided means for them to be there then that would be far better and equally hey adventure capital at the time needed a home so why not create the York Butter Factory through that process. Absolutely. I mean, speaking of homes and communities and, and sort of grassroots, my very first touch point with the Melbourne startup community when I was based in Sydney was doing a startup weekend here, which Stage Label came out of as well. So my understanding of the entire Melbourne startup ecosystem at that time was your Butter Factory and everything kind of kind of building out from that. But obviously now you've, you've seen, um, there are I think something like 78 different co-working spaces in, in Victoria. Um, YBF was certainly one of the first ones to, to kind of really make a mark and, and help develop the local ecosystem here. Um, what was, you know, kind of at the early stages, what was the ecosystem like at that time and how does that sort of compare to what you're sort of seeing locally now? Yeah, look, I think that it was basically very um, dispersed and it was also very um, disparate at that, that point in time. So there was not much sort of integration or interaction or... Um, engagement between different groups so you know it was sort of you're either part of one group or you were part of another group you wouldn't sort of you know be part of many groups and I think that that's been you know fantastic to sort of see as the ecosystem has grown and you know the ecosystem of communities that have been based or seeded and scaled out of the York Butter Factory now number something like 80, 82, 83 individual communities and they might be something as small as you know your you know hacks for good through to your you know fintech Melbourne or Peak Fifteen Health Tech, which are now thousands of of members individually and, and are doing so in even faster and faster sort of you know rates. Um, you know the good thing what that we I guess tried to always do was if the ecosystem is going to be successful, the ecosystem really needs. Um, to take a mindset of abundance. If it's a zero-sum game, then you know, effectively everyone's going to lose. And certainly in those early days, it, there was a little bit of that tension that went around. It's sort of, you know, if somebody won or somebody seemed to be gaining prominence or, you know, um, I guess, uh, notoriety or, or popularity, people in that true sort of Australian way wanted to sort of cut them down. But fundamentally, if entrepreneurship is to work, then hey, it's got to be a model of abundance. You've got to believe that you know the, the, the bigger, the better, the more interactive, collaborative, then the, the better the outcomes can possibly possibly be. And I guess that's really been an essence of, of what your butter factory has stand or stood for and stands for uh, into the future. It's like how do we create a, a sustainable um, ecosystem here? How do we create the, the I guess that flow from the grassroots up? 
because as we've seen proven in the latest media reports, Australia is last, dead last in creating high growth businesses um, from government funded uh, research and development. So there's a big problem here that needs to be fixed and it's not fixed by, by putting more money into research and development and more money into innovation um, hubs that sit within universities. It's the other end of the spectrum that's going to actually enable people to be better entrepreneurs, people to understand commercialisation, people to, to have the skills and abilities to create those companies that we're now starting to see really take off. And I think there's a heap of them. You look just around the York Butter Factory, you've had Pepperstone FX, somewhere in a half billion dollar sort of range over five years, never raised venture capital. You know, you look down the street at Invado, same, same. You know, what are they worth? They're one of the most profitable businesses, if not the most profitable startup, um, you know, if you can even call them that anymore, um, that's in the market. You've got then Redbubble, Kogan, um, you know, there's an enormous number of businesses moving out into Collingwood. You've obviously got the entire site point group across the river into Kogan. Um, and then you've got your first round of businesses, your car sales, your REA, your Seek, your computer share, um, your IRS. Like, the, just the, the list is just really, really growing. And that's Melbourne. It's, and it's not about Melbourne and Sydney because we're fighting Melbourne and Sydney. We're fighting the wrong fight. It's about how we get Australian talent liberated into the global markets and successful in those those global markets absolutely i mean in terms of uh, i'd be really interested to hear because obviously you've got the the co-working space uh which is ybf and you've got the adventure capital model and um you know obviously you do a range of things with with corporates as well um can you elaborate a little bit more on on the model that you're sort of working with and, and how you how you work and engage with startups yeah, so obviously we started with the investing piece and um, that's a difficult uh, proposition to run subscale and by subscale I mean anywhere sort of south of $30 million is very difficult to support a team on a standalone basis um, and especially if you're relying on the you know, returns from exits which typically you know somewhere between three to five years of gestation before they start to actually bring in some real growth and some uh, liquidity. Um, so we moved from I guess essentially what was a, a cash flow unsustainable business to co-working, which um, you know, in theory was the, the next step to bridge the gap, but also solve some of our problems around that home of the, the network and uh, a center point for all of the innovation and the ecosystem. Um, again, as a standalone uh, business model, the, the co-working one can be difficult, especially when you select for the, the most earliest of entrepreneurs who typically don't have a huge amount of money. So um, as time progressed, we realized that you know, creating the venture side of things as well as the co-working side of things uh, was innately um, interesting to a lot of people, particularly I guess the product partners. So we had a lot of um, you know collaboration opportunities with people like Microsoft and AWS and Zendesk and other local supporters. Uh, and then as an extension to that, a lot of corporate Australia started to wake up to the opportunity that was sitting underneath their nose. So I mean, as you would remember from Startup Weekend in the early days, a lot of uh, that early interest was from companies like Optus and their uh, Innovate program. Um, moving a little bit forward in terms of years, we started to do a little bit of consulting work to Coles, which was, uh, I guess, fascinating from a retail tech perspective because they were interested in a lot of the new and upcoming technologies that we were seeing on a daily basis as part of the deal flow for the fund. Um, and I guess as we've progressed forward in time, we've really matured that um, corporate partner offering to, I guess, leverage the interesting and talented people within our network um, to solve some problems at the uh, corporate level. So now our uh, corporate partner list includes the likes of ANZ Bank, Ernst & Young, uh, Qantas, Dentsu. We've got some uh, really interesting people solving some interesting problems and um, we've got all the right people in our building and around us and uh, in our alumni that can help solve those problems. So I think we've we've had our own journey about trying to find a sustainable business model and uh, after five or six, it's actually probably coming up on seven years now, it's really starting to take shape. It, yeah, in, in terms of um, in terms of sort of your your really close partnerships with the likes of sort of ANZ, um, it's it, it's a really unique offering that um, that you provide compared to you know some things that are already existing in, in the startup ecosystem. How do you see startups and corporates working closer together, or, or what do you think are things? Uh, I, you know, I, I've spoken to this with a couple of podcast guests as well about how. Um, you know, in the startup community, we tend to dismiss anything that comes from the corporate space of, you know, it being very, very slow, uh, if not understanding sort of startup culture, but there are a lot of things that we can learn from, from people about, particularly about scale and execution. 
Um, I, yeah, I'd, I'd be really sort of interested to hear what, what are some of the things that you think or, or some of the opportunities where startups and, and corporates can, can collaborate closer together. Yeah, for sure. And um, you know, I guess it's definitely been an evolution. So you know, the first thing that obviously was built um, you know, within and around uh, the York Butter Factory was the community of startup and entrepreneurs. And that's always the thing which we held with, the, I guess, the highest regard and the highest value. Um, and the reason why we started to move towards corporates and can see that there was potentially opportunity there was because we were finding within the, the Melbourne ecosystem, the Australian ecosystem, there was a strength within the business-to-business domain. What's, what is it that a startup actually requires you know, first and as early as possible is access to market? Um, you know, we could certainly see that there was a, a, a definitive need that to access the corporate sector was going to be beneficial. Um, reciprocally, on the side of the corporate partners, we very quickly found that there was an appetite and a need for them to start to understand, you know, how the startup sector actually works. How is it that effectively these startup tools that are being used are creating businesses on a, I guess, a disproportionate rate? to what a traditional corporate, a large corporate, is able to actually do. Um, how is it that they actually overcome things which you know, impede, um, impede them internally? So things like corporate inertia or culture or systems and processes or bureaucracy, you know, these are things that large companies have to deal with, that small companies, agile companies, startup technology companies, um, disruptive companies don't have to deal with on a daily basis so provides an enormous amount of inspiration for them and corporate uh, or cultural change within large corporates it's very difficult to do from within so it's like where is the source of the change going to be able to be created and that's really where we started to say there's a real opportunity here to create and what we've termed to be an open innovation platform and that open innovation platform is where we bring corporates out of their environment and into effectively what is the startup and entrepreneurial environment to provide that inspiration. Um, we've also found that you know, corporates can be difficult in that regard, so it's better to be able to do it you know, inside our environment in a different sort of space where people probably feel a little more free to experiment, free to express, uh, more creative, more open to be creative, to sh- safe to share their ideas. Um, but what it also does is starts to inspire them as to how to do things differently. And one of the capabilities that's desperately lacking within corporate Australia is that in the case of corporate venturing. So corporate venturing, I don't mean going and creating a direct investment fund, although that might be part of that capability, but it's more about how they actually understand and can benefit from what's happening out on the frontier. Because that's really where most startups are actually focusing themselves, is right out there on the edges, right on the frontier. And that's a very difficult place for for essentially the core business of mature industries to be able to access. So that's really where we started to to identify that value. And and I guess the the third piece of the open innovation platform we're now bringing forward is, is the academic and university, which has the same characteristics as corporate in that inside it has a, its own sort of culture. Um, and, you know, I guess what we're seeing is is that when that culture is unleashed within the, the or, or essentially liberated from their own four walls and moved into the startup world, that there's really some exciting opportunities that, that are created as a result. And so, you know, startup techniques are not always going to be able to solve for all problems. But if we've got an amazing resource capability, which we do here in Australia, it's clear if it's applied in a different way, in an industry-centric way, I reckon there's not many problems that can't be solved by bringing the right parties together. Absolutely. And I mean, just to, to highlight some of the um, some of the close activity that you have with some of the largest corporates in, in Australia, you've got Mike Smith, who's a former CEO of ANZ, as part of your... Who's your chairman now? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I guess ask you what it's like having someone like him as part of your your board and, and what what that's meant for uh for your business and what um you know sort of extrapolating out from that what um what sort of startups when they're looking to to build their own boards um what some of the the things that they should be looking for um in terms of key skills or, or key people to kind of fill those particular roles for them yeah well i guess you know yeah at the, the most sort of simple level like to have somebody like mike smith um, interested in joining your board um, is immensely humbling. You know, we're, uh, we're a business as YBF that's still young, that's still growing, that still believes that it's got an enormous amount of potential to, to fulfill. Um, 
we've managed to secure somebody who is probably one of the top 10 or amongst the top 10 CEOs in corporate Australia, if not essentially recognised on a, on a much, you know, much more significant level, given that the Australian banks have, some, have been some of the biggest and most profitable in the world for the last decade or so. Um, so in some ways it's, you know, first of all humbling, then it becomes intimidating. How is it that essentially that, a, that, a, that our company can actually work effectively with Mike? What is it that actually brings us together? Um, and I think that the, you know, one of the key things there is, is that, that Mike has an insatiable curiosity for, um, for the entrepreneurial domain and how essentially the Australian economy can benefit from this being effective and how important it is for Australia's economic prosperity going forward um, that this actually works. Um, and I guess that really matches with what Darcy and I have been about, which is how is it that we can actually make the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Australia from the grassroots up more effective? Um, how does it essentially become a mechanism to start to pivot the Australian economy because we know big corporate Australia is actually shrinking in the number of jobs that they're actually you know, um, providing within the economy. Where the growth is actually prone to, to, to be able to happen and has the potential to happen on a, on an, on a extraordinarily strong economic, con, I guess, accretive basis is in this startup sector. You know, for every one job that we create in, in these, these environments like the York Butter Factory, it creates five more. It's an immense magnifying effect for, for economies. And, and I think that that's really where you know, the, the relationship is, is very much focused. How do we create that? How do we, how do we you know, create something which has got permanence and sustainability? Um, and in doing so, you know, there's, it's not just simply about you know, creating um, you know, something of ego or something of mass or something of dollar size, but it's more about creating something that's going to, to change, I guess, um, and make a permanent impact. Uh, and beneficial impact on an ongoing basis. And so to come back to, I guess, the question about you know, governance and board composition, um, just because you are familiar in the practice of uh, good corporate governance doesn't mean that you need to load it all over the small business that you're running. Um, you know, I think we've taken a very pragmatic and a very lean approach to the board, even though you know, we have Mike at the chair uh, guiding the way. So we haven't gone out and added um, a lot of independence and uh, random skills. We're gonna, at the moment, we'll continue to persevere with the three of us on the board uh, because we feel like it's the startup way and it's the way to get things done. Um, to look at our portfolio of companies that we've helped guide over the last few years, uh, I think we've taken a view that it's really one of our responsibilities to introduce slowly at the right pace the the level of governance required for where that company is at the time. So if you you know three people uh, in a typical uh, startup composition just putting a pitch deck together and getting some. Uh, you know, uh, early wins on the board, then you probably don't need a board at all. You do your AGM and sign off and your basic paperwork, but you just work. Um, I guess as you get closer to looking at VC uh, and Series A kind of rounds, then you probably need to be producing some basic documentation. You know, obviously you need to be compliant, but um, preparing a, extensive agendas and minutes and action registers is probably not the best use of your time. So. Um, as much as you can get away with you know, the, the practical level of governance that is appropriate for the level that you're at, um, it will come in time. So I don't think you, know, you should race to dump yourself uh, with layers and layers of admin. Enjoy the, um, the freedom and flexibility that comes with the agility that is being a startup. And if you grow eventually in time, you'll, uh, you'll have your way and you'll have a big board and all of the uh, complications that come with it. <laughs> Um, so you, you touched on, um, I think you, you mentioned there's about 80 odd sort of startups that have gone, to, you know, gone through the sort of YBF process, if, if you can call it that, and have gone on to raise sort of um, build sustainable and successful businesses. Um, I just wanted to t focus on two, uh, Equium and Clover, who you, I know both of you have sort of worked with closely. Um, I just wanted to, um, yeah, I, I guess if you can elaborate a little bit on the two startups and, and what they do and, and how you sort of helped build those companies to where they are today. Yeah, well, I, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, while we've been an investor for pretty much the period that we've been working together, um, we've been very active in our uh, own businesses, whether that's creating, you know, the Adventure Capital uh, Investment Management Company, the York Butter Factory as a separate business, um, but also, I guess, in the companies that we've invested in, we've typically become quite involved, particularly in the early days, because we... 
uh, needed to figure out what it was that we were good at and how we could help. And so for me personally, I would jump into these businesses in, uh, you know, COO or operational roles in order to um, understand and get used to running businesses and uh, providing all the ancillary services. So I guess it's worth pointing out before we jump into those two that sort of founding things is also really within our DNA. Um, so I'll probably pass to Stu who really did the, uh, the Equium stuff back early in our history. Yeah, so so basically I guess our first first origination really was uh, you know working together to create uh, create Equium. And so Equium really came out of a, a conversation. And that uh, you know that conversation was one between uh, Lorenz Grollo and I whereby he was uh, lamenting the fact that you know he desperately needed he needed Facebook for his for his building, the Rialto. You know, the Rialto was 25 years old and it was about to lose its premium grade um, uh, asset categorization. That was going to cost him an enormous amount of money, and they wouldn't be able to attract the best clients. And he didn't know even who was in his building. And the conversation continued to say, "So, Lorenz, why is it that you need why do you need a Facebook? Why, you know, Facebook kind of already exists. Why duplicate that or try and do something the same? What is it that you're actually trying to unpack? And that, uh, you know, that conversation was the genesis of what now is, you know, knocking on the door of being a centurion, being the equine business, which you know delivers from, I think, nine of the ten major real estate investment trusts in uh, in the country, and somewhere in the city of four and a half million square meters that are being serviced across uh, across this Australia and very soon to be into international markets. Um, but that wasn't an easy sort of process. It, you know, before it actually sort of you know, started, there was a good 18 months of effort to launch it just in one building. Um, we brought in uh, Gabrielle McMillan to, to be initially the GM and then she, she's become the CEO and been a fantastic, uh, I guess, um, entrepreneur and CEO um, for that company and to, to see it grow to now almost 250 people across the country is an amazing, uh, I guess, you know, accolade and, and, and I guess takes a lot of, lot of pride. Um, you know, but what it sort of demonstrated was that we were able to, I guess, take a business from zero to one. And, uh, and as Darcy was sort of saying, what is it that, that, you know, that we're good at, that, uh, you know, that adventure capital and YBF are good at? And I think, you know, in terms of my own hypothesis, it's like, uh, you know, if you're going to be a good investor, you're going to need to know how to essentially take businesses through particular phases. Some people, you know, might be a, a one to end. So once a business is in steady state growth, they can drive incremental growth. Some people can drive change. Some people can rescue businesses. Where we're focused on is starting and getting business into to essentially a scaling position. And we've managed to, to generate quite a strong track record in doing so now across multiple businesses, which uh, which is something that we see as a very unique capability within both you know venture capital and uh, and YBF and Equium being essentially the leading um, candidate in that space, but far from the from the only one. With Darcy uh, being involved in the founding team of uh, of Clover within that fintech domain. So obviously being uh, competitive between the two of us, I couldn't let Stu have the uh, roaring success of Equium and uh, me not follow up with something else. So um, in late 2014, um, we were having some discussions and essentially presenting some of the findings of a fintech white paper we'd produced to one of our corporate partners. And I was laying out all of the different uh, fintech trends that were likely to hit Australia and shores in the next coming years. And one of them uh, happened to be that Betterment Wealthfront model that we um, absolutely loved and so did the um, person presenting or we were presenting to and um, after a, literally a, a half a day of conversation they pretty much had turned around and said that we'd love to fund that and uh, if you were to make this a company we'd um, gladly support you with the seed capital to do so. Um, it didn't quite work out exactly with that uh, company itself but within a handful of months we'd um, assembled a team of three people and um, were aggressively moving to get the company regulated properly by ASIC, um, which wasn't uh, exactly easy given that they didn't really know how to deal with algorithms de delivering financial advice. So we engaged to that process and started to work with them on the consultation papers and uh, essentially hold their hand through that journey. Um, when we came to realise that we'd have to sort out some funding pretty soon, um, it became immediately apparent upon pulling the CEO Harry Shimei out of a quip super that 
um, the, the CEO of Equip, Danielle, wasn't going to let him go very far without finding what he was up to. And upon telling her that we were building a robo advice platform, she thought that sounds like an amazing opportunity for the 50,000 members that were in her super fund. Um, so shortly thereafter, you know, we engaged in some conversations. We um, got our term sheet together, and before we knew it, we had um, a pre-product funding round sorted. So, um, you know, that was 2015 or mid 2015, and ever since then, we've you know been building that product. So uh, Clover was released to the public officially on the 16th of December in 2016. Um, so we've been live for a few months. Um, we're really happy with how it's growing and you know we've now pulled together a really solid team of 10 people Um, it's my favorite part of that business is that I've drawn people from various parts of my own personal network so uh, Sahil Cora, Harry Shamay and I essentially the uh, the lead on that business have all worked together previously in uh, Mercer Investment Consulting so um, very different backgrounds and subsequently went on to do different things, but we, we shared a few years together working really solidly together. So we knew that we would make a really good uh, group. And then from there moved into um, pulling some of the more technical resources, compliance people and uh, the marketing people, which we all selectively um, picked out of our network to, to make it one of the best teams that I know in terms of a pound for pound um, basis. So. Um, yeah, we've got great hopes for that company. We're really excited to be part of it, and um, I guess my personal challenge is to make it as successful as Equium as the uh, the follow on origination for uh, our group. So um, I, I guess looking at uh, you know um, both Equium and Clover and, and uh, the range of different startups that you that you've sort of seen and, and come across, um, what are some of the you know obviously sort of getting that initial core team uh, as sorry Darcy as you. Uh, so, Stuart, as, as you mentioned, there are different phases of, of business growth. Um, I was just wondering, what are some of the less talked about um, issues that come up when you're trying to scale a business from that initial, hey, we've got an idea, let's launch this, and we've seen some early traction to building something that's you know, a 250-person organization? Yeah. I think that um, the best place to start is sort of, you know, founding team DNA. So, you know, what is the constitution of the group that's actually brought this business into into existence um, and how do they actually sort of get along and cope? Because guaranteed it's not going to be a perfect and successful and linear um, experience. In fact, it's going to be far from that. So, you know, it's, it's it, you know, the, the old adage that people do business with people couldn't be more true. A lot of people think that by solving the technology problem, by solving that product problem, um, by solving the you know this process problem, that their problems are going to be fixed or you know resolved, and or they're going to be in some ways uh, assured of success. But if you can't glue the people together, the relationships, create them in the right way um, to be able to be resilient and to manage through the ups and downs, then you know it's. It's probably started to be talked about, and you know, I guess failure isn't a isn't a great topic within Australian society still today. Um, but it's a hard journey. People who choose the entrepreneurial journey, people who choose that path less less trodden, um, are really choosing a very difficult pathway. And it's the human cost that I think that is not probably you know appreciated, and the human factors that go into essentially success or failure, which I think that are that are undermined, particularly within the media. Everyone wants to know about the, the overnight success story. They don't want to know potentially about the 10 years of probably you know almost poverty that, that essentially preceded it. Um, but it's not poverty, but because they're doing what they love, it's the sacrifice and the level of sacrifice that people are willing to make. Um, but that comes at a cost. Like Sacrifice is not free. Um, so that, I think that, that the human aspects of this uh, are something that's probably you know, not talked about as much. And obviously, you know, I think if you know any of those ten-year overnight successes, if you were to ask them, would you do it again? They'd probably still say, you know, yes, but there'll be a hesitation, right? Because you know, at least if they were to do it again, they'd know how to essentially navigate a lot of these challenges. But because it's, there's no process or no rule book to essentially you know, respond to those those challenges because they don't come in a consecutive line. It depends upon what's actually happening with the within the individuals that are a part of that life that makes all of the all of the difference. Are they supported? Are they confident? Are they able to to essentially communicate effectively? How do they communicate under pressure? Um, you know, when things go right, when things go wrong, um, how is it? How do they deal with success? Because you know, dealing with success could actually be their greatest weakness. 
Yeah, I mean, it, I think about it as the that phrase, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration, and the perspiration is the important thing. The idea is near nothing. So, um, But what the perspiration requires is motivation, and what the motivation requires is the psychology of, you know, keeping yourself right as you, you know, piece it all together. So, you know, having a good team, having, you know, a supported, you know, supportive family, you know, making sure when we look at our external businesses, you know, wives and girlfriends are key stakeholders, as you well know. So, you know, making sure that people are looking after themselves as well as the people around them. They're not under huge financial duress. You know, the um, when the, the waves of stress kind of pile up and um, gather on top of each other, you know, how do you, how do you release that? Um, and so there's, a, yeah, a lot of, I don't think any of the, problems that we've faced which were really really challenging over the course of our business or you know looking at the businesses of other people um, have been technology issues nearly as much as they've been people issues it's like, how do you how do you keep people on the right track motivated inspired um, and pulling in the same direction not fighting each other not fighting the board not you know all of these things are just so crucial to um, you know it's a hard enough task to take on big established um, incumbent businesses especially if you don't you know bind together as a team and achieve that common goal which people occasionally get a little bit off track and don't realize that they're doing it um in terms of your recent experience with clover um in, in building out you know essentially a rockstar team and, and getting sort of pre-product funding um two of the most common sort of graphs that i see with early stage startup founders is you know i'm finding it really difficult to find co-founders, let alone the right co-founder. A lot of them sort of, you know, especially when they're non-tech, bring on the first tech, you know, developer that says yes to their product and, you know, they hand them 30 percent equity and they find it really difficult to get funding as well. Um, can you kind of share, you know, what are, what are some of the things, uh, you know, obviously from, both from a perspective of you being entrepreneurs and, and building out your own products to also, you know, leading out funds on, uh, you know, through adventure capital. Um, what is it that, that you know, sets out, um, good founders in terms of, and good founding teams, and what is it that makes you sort of make that decision, make that leap in, in sort of uh, putting resources and funds behind a particular idea or behind a particular team? Yeah, well, like I think we've taken a view that uh, the longevity of relationship is really an important factor in making big decisions. So, you know, in my instance with Clover, I wasn't taking a big punt on my co-founders because, um, you know, Warren had worked in the York Butter Factory for a couple of years and was well known to us. And I'd worked with Sahil and Harry, um, you know, in a previous life. So there wasn't, I wasn't taking a lot of risk in those two people, I suppose, or three people. And I suppose, you know, in the same way that Adventure Capitals used the York Butter Factory as a proving ground to make investment decisions, you know, we like to sit with the people that we're working with, you know, who stays late, who works hard, who, um, you know, uh, is engaged and works helps other people um, but not to their detriment um, so I don't think we've necessarily you know been one of those groups that's pr prided ourselves on being really quick with decisions we don't sit across the table for an hour and then cut a check at the end of it um, nor do we jump into bed with the first person we think might be a good country manager for our new business so um, I I think that's worked in our favor over time. I certainly am happy with the way that that Clover founding team's come into being. Um, but there's also ways that you can mitigate those risks of bad decisions. And I've seen this play out a number of times and um, it's pretty simple. Like there's a, a basic legal mechanism that you can put in place called a vesting agreement. And if you do that right, then I think you can structure it such that any time that someone decides to not stay with that business, um, you can both look each other in the eyes and say, I think that that's fine and I understand why you're doing this. And um, if you're two years into a four year vesting period and you only walk away with half the shares that you initially had signed up for, then you probably can uh, be at peace with that, knowing that the other people that are gonna go on to continue to build the business will have the full allocation and those that um, decided that, you know, the, the poverty and the stress and the difficulty of the entrepreneurial life uh, is it for them, then at least they have a piece of that business and it's probably representative of what they contributed in the early and risky days of it. Yeah. But it also leaves a, enough on the table as well if, because if you need to bring in a new CXO, whatever that X happens to be, or new tech lead, um, you wanna have some room in your, I guess, cap table to, to, to bring them in. Um, and uh, you know, I think that that's a really important sort of you know, thing to think through as, you know, as you're entering that sort of startup phase. 
you know, what are the simple things that you can get right in, in founding the you know, things in the right way um, on, a, on a corporate and legal level. Um, but you know, legal agreements aren't that good and you're only generally relying upon them when stuff goes really bad um, rather than when things go really good. Um, so, and again, we've kind of touched on this several times through, through the podcast, but um, both of you and YBF and Adventure Capital were some of the major building blocks behind um, the Victorian startup ecosystem. Um, just really quickly wanted to get a view on, you know, what do you think um, is happening at the moment? What would you like to see more of? What, would, what do you think can be improved on um, in, in Victoria's startup ecosystem to both help you and, and help sort of the, the startup founders and, and everyone else who's, um, who's part of the community here be, be successful? Maybe I'll deal with what's now and you can deal with what's future, which tends to be the way we split our <laughs> time. Um, so look, I think the, uh, the ecosystem's more functional than it's ever been before, at least in my memory. And you know, going back to what we were talking about before when we were starting hackathons like Startup Weekend back six years ago and um, the meetup groups, they were all quite generalist. And what we've seen now is this real um, you know, dividing into smaller, more niche, more relevant groups, which are actually a lot more meaningful for people to get around. So, um, you know, whether that's a particular infrastructure as a service or a, you know, a product or, a, you know, a, a theme like blockchain or um, more specific, like know your client for blockchain, like people can have these conversations with relevant and interested groups. And I think we have a real depth of, um, an ecosystem that allows people to find the right people and, and start to talk about the areas of interest that they need. Um, the, the night and day part of it, what we're seeing at the moment relative to six years ago is the, uh, the amount of capital that's in the ecosystem. So, um, you know, there was probably some uh, very few people in the early stage funding environment when we first joined, if any. In fact, I would say that no one was writing a check below $5 million when we uh, first uh, put a venture capital together so um, now we see lots of funds that are in the 250 million dollar range probably totaling up to a couple of billion dollars in dry powder to deploy so I think for the first time I'm seeing now probably more money than opportunity which is you know a really good turning point to see and I think good companies now can get funded which you know certainly wasn't necessarily the case a few years ago so that's absolutely positive. Uh, Corporate Australia, again, is supporting in terms of the, the revenue that it's putting into the ecosystem, so sponsoring events, running proofs of concept, um, all sorts of ways for, I guess, the money to come out of the uh, share market into the private market, which is, I guess, completely uh, required for a functional ecosystem. So um, I think everything's humming right now. We're really happy with where it is. It's really positive. Um, but I think it can only get better from here. Um, so, Stu? Yeah, no, I think that um, you know, the, the risks are that essentially as, as we sort of you know, pr- proceed and things feel like they're, they're, they're good, um, that people sort of maybe less rest on their laurels a little or begin to, to essentially get excited about their own contributions versus those of the collaborative contributions which have been made over a longer period of time. Um, and I think that that's where you know, we need to, to continue to, to catalyze the collaboration. You know, there's no, nobody holds monopolies over anything within the startup ecosystem as I think we're at where people's mindset needs to be. Um, and everybody contributes and, and hopefully the ecosystem is going to be then there for, there for them um, when they're looking to, to be able to, to gain support from it. So you know, I think that you know, government definitely has a, has a role and it needs to, to play the right role on an ongoing basis. Um, and that's not in a market intervention way, it's in a, essentially supporting the whole ecosystem way. Um, government has the worst track record of picking winners and it's not where we want them to be. They shouldn't be running venture funds, they shouldn't be running incubators, they shouldn't be you know, supplement, supplementing real estate, they should be leaving that to the market to, to essentially resolve. Um, but the support and the messaging and the policies, I think, are really evolving. And if we can start to shift more of that R&D focus and funding out of the input side, where you're just dropping the money into to actually academic research and balance it towards effectively this commercialization side, there is an enormous latent capacity, which I think can be, can be unleashed. And I think that we've proven to ourselves, even with policy settings which were clearly suboptimal and an ecosystem which historically hasn't been as, as anywhere near as vibrant, functional, collaborative that we've, than we've ever seen before, can we really bring us up to being world class? 
there'd be nothing worse than essentially having the potential to be world class and ascend, and and just desperately failing because we refuse to, to change that we just rest on our laurels so you know we we really need to keep driving that that change and keep pursuing the opportunities that are that are right here right now so we can create more atlassians more red bubbles more successes that are not recognized just here domestically but on a global basis Absolutely. And, and in terms of, you know, when I sort of look at YBF and Adventure Capital and, and the model that both of you have built, um, what kind of sticks out to me is, is the patience in terms of the vision that both of you are chasing and how it's evolved over, over time to kind of meet, meet the needs. So what's, what's next for, for the two of you? Where are, you know, what's the next step for, um, for your model and, and for your business? Yeah, look, I think that, um, you know, to, you know, we've always sort of grown things here in the York Butter Factory, particularly around density and diversity. And, you know, we're not just talking about gender diversity, we're talking about diversity in a far more broad sort of sense. So, you know, moving into larger premises, um, so we can really unleash that because the York Butter Factory has been full for the best part of the last two years. Um, and counting. Um, despite that, in that same period of time, companies that have either been here or essentially originated out of here have created 400 new jobs. And then in that process, they've contributed somewhere in the city of $100 million to the Australian economy, the majority of that being here in Victoria. So even on a constrained basis, that's the sort of value that can be created. So as we increase the size of the, the platform or the innovation precincts, which we're working to, uh, to do at this point in time, um, you know, naturally we're going to be able to really unleash a lot more. Um, and that's that sort of density, that increased density at scale, I think that's really the opportunity which we're, we're seizing on. So new premises is definitely on the, on the cards, um, continuing to essentially build that um, interface between corporate Australia and the startup community. Um, you know, and that needs to be done in the right way. It needs to be value accretive for both sides in order for it work to work and bring forward academia. Like academia shouldn't be essentially just a, a, a um, quarantined group. They need to be deeply involved. Um, you know, they need to have the opportunities to bring forward that amazing intellectual talent and rigour and approach, um, but it needs to be you know, really brought forward in the right way. Trying to do it you know, within the academic environment, it's really, really difficult and it's something that really um, is distinct when you look at effectively locations and Ivy League schools in the United States um, versus essentially what happens here in Australia. And then, you know, even more so around the necessity you see out of, um, I guess, geographies like Israel, um, where they have to actually innovate in order to survive. That's something that Australia doesn't have. We are, unfortunately, the lucky country in that regard. 20 years plus of economic prosperity means people don't have to fight that much just to exist. Um, that's something that, you know, that we're not going to have here, so we've got to create our own reasons to, to actually do that. So for, for any of our listeners who want to find out more, um, stay in touch, you know, get in contact with you, uh, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, they can come to the uh, York Butter Factory website and um, reach out to our community management function, which is um, very talented and uh, very responsive. So yorkbutterfactory.com and um, yeah, reach out. We're happy to talk to people, support people uh, at the uh, beginning, middle and end of their journey. So. Um, if you're in Melbourne, then you know I think that's sort of our reason to be is uh, engaging with interesting people. Uh, I think we get happy to say that we've got one of the best jobs in the world, where we have uh, inspired and talented and uh, intelligent people coming to us uh, most days, if not you know, every day, with uh, an understanding of the world and what's broken about it and how they want to fix it, which is um, I guess in infective and. Uh, really opti optimistic and we, we appreciate being uh, able to be that sponge that absorbs all of this interesting information and assimilates that and helps shape the way that we look at the future and what we want to do and how do we want to tactically um, move within the interesting world that is technology in Australia. Perfect. I'll make sure that your website link is in the show notes and I highly recommend reaching out to, to the YBF crew um, and their talented team. So, um, Stuart and Darcy, once again, thanks so much for your time and, and for sharing your in experience and insights today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Roy. Thanks for listening to episode 40 of the Startup Playbook podcast. You can find the show notes of my interview with Stuart and Darcy along with a curated list of tools and resources for startup founders at startupplaybook.co. 
As always, you can join the conversation through our Twitter account. The handle is at Playbook Startup. Next week, I will be interviewing Kate Talbot, an entrepreneur, marketer, and author. She wrote the book, Oh Snap, You Can Use Snapchat for Business as a guide to helping startups and businesses get the most out of the Snapchat platform. In the interview, we will be talking about how to craft your own story on social media, how to build an audience on Snapchat, and how to use the platform for B2B or premium products. Don't forget to check out the first four episodes of Startup Playbook TV on YouTube and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you at episode 41 next week.